Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Baha'i International Community of the United Nations Office. My name is Barney Dugal, and I'm the principal representative to the UN. We thank you very much for joining us at this side event, Youth and Adolescents, edu Educating the Protagonists of Social Change. We are looking forward to a really good discussion and to actually to be learning from all of you here today and, uh, uh, and from our illustrious speakers whom I will introduce in just a little bit. But the focus of our discussion, um, we will, in, the fo uh, you know, in light of the focus of our discussion, we will be focusing on the role of education in helping young people to participate fully and meaningfully in the life of society. And we also want to explore educational processes that help young people to recognize and develop their potentials, their talents, and to see themselves as protagonists uh, of change in their own lives and in the world of their communities and around the world. We are very happy that the Commission has uh, decided to focus on youth and adolescents, um, a population which encompasses some 1 billion people between the ages of 10 through 19. And during this period of their lives in many countries, young people are taking on new responsibilities, providing care at home, contributing to the family income, and in some cases even starting their own family finishing their formal and non-formal education, and really starting to explore their values and beliefs. On some level, that there's an assumption that uh, all youth are protagonists of social change, with their energy, their idealism, and their searching minds. But this does not happen automatically. The potential to be this kind of actor is inherent to varying degrees in all people, in all young people. Yet these must be nurtured and supported over time to allow these qualities to emerge and develop. The connection between informal and non-formal or formal education and well-being is of course established in the ICPD program of action, but it's not fully elaborated, particularly on what is meant by quality education. The question is really central in many ways. Because the future of our society will depend on how effectively educational programs are able to tap into and discover the potential which is inherent in young people and prepare them to play an active role in the world that they will inherit. Many of the approaches to education today treat the students in a very passive way as receptacles of information rather than active members of their community. We hear many youth saying that governments need to take them more seriously, need to hear their perspectives, and allow youth to play a greater role in decision-making processes. And in some uh, countries, governments have gotten the message, and are, we are seeing youth more and more uh, on government delegations, uh, to meetings at the UN and elsewhere, at international meetings or spaces that are being uh, even being created for uh, hearing their contributions. Yet, if governments put these opportunities in place, we ask what kind of capacity building needs to be taking place in order for that participation to be meaningful. We need to think of the different environments in which youth are growing up the many forces that are acting on them, media, technology, family, peers, the wider community, and their social institutions. How these forces combine to shape their identity, give them the tools to express themselves fully, and take charge of their development. So, uh, again, I'd like to acknowledge all of the wonderful young people in this room and those who were young ones and have gained a lot of experience and are going to share with us that experience in our discussion. We hope to have a very interactive uh, session today. I especially want to also uh, acknowledge uh, um, Mr. Uh, Gerhard Heine, uh, who is the Chief of the Population Division at the UN and 
uh, a very special welcome to our speakers, the Deputy Permanent Representative of Haina, Ambassador Avinador Kayubwe, and uh, we are going to be joined by Dr. Lara Lasky from uh, UNFPA, whom I believe is running a little late. And we have uh, Alicia Zarayi from uh, the Baha'i International Community. So, uh, Ambassador uh, Abinado uh, Kanyike uh, is the Vice Chair uh, of the Bureau of the 45th uh, Commission on Population and Development. And prior to his assumption of duty on December 15, 2010, as uh, the Minister and Deputy Permanent Representative of Ghana to the UN, uh, His Excellency was Chief of Protocol at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ghana, and he had earlier served as Director of the Africa and the African Union Bureau from October 2008 to July 2009, following a six and a half year secondment to the Economic Community of West African States, also known as ECOWAS, and uh, at its headquarters in Abuja. In 2007, he served as the acting director of the External Relations Department in the office of the president of the ECOWAS uh, Commission. He holds a master's degree in international affairs from the University of Ghana, where his MA dissertation was on the topic of conflict management in Africa in the 1980s, outlook for the 90s and beyond. <laughs> Uh, his postgraduate diploma is in International Relations and Diplomacy, and he has a BA in a Combined Honours Degree uh, from the University of Ghana. Uh, Ambassador Abinado Kanige is member of the Executive Board of the West African Network for Peace Building, and he's also currently serving on the Bureau of the United Nations Commission, as I already mentioned. Um, our delegate, our youth delegate from the Baha'i International Community is Alicia. Uh, and uh, Alicia Zarahi is a student at the University of Toronto in Canada. And within the University of Toronto's International Development Co-op Program. Is that what it's called? Cooperative, Cooperative Program. Um, Alicia has focused on health and environmental sciences and her uh, cooperative program took her to Zambia last year where she worked for a knowledge translation platform and collaborated closely with the Zambian Ministry of Health on research and policy issues. While in Zambia, Alicia spearheaded a major research project on male involvement in women's reproductive health with an ur urban slum setting. Her research was supervised by Zambia's Minister of Health as well as Canada Research Chair in International Health. She has volunteered, my gosh, Alicia, for your youth, there's a lot on this. She has volunteered on the African continent, involved in running arts empowerment programs for HIV AIDS orphans in Tanzania, and she's also been working with a junior youth empowerment program, and, uh, and there's a lot more. So I'm going to allow Alicia to talk to us when she uh, shares her experience because I think some of these interesting experiences she has uh, uh, had will come through at that time. So we are really looking forward to uh, this uh, session which is going to have an interactive component and we have asked uh, our speakers to focus on three questions because uh, you know to us at the Baha'i international community, this age group of, of younger adults and uh, junior youth is really important. And we find that uh, adolescents are often portrayed in a negative light. The troubled teen is an example of the types of phrases that are often used to refer to adolescents. So we'd like to explore, you know, what are some of the implications of these perceptions? Do you think they are accurate? And if not, how do you perceive the attributes and potential of young people because we believe that there's a lot of potential there and sometimes uh, using these stereotypes are really just that, stereotypes and don't accurately describe young people in, in this age group uh, or their potential. 
So some of the questions that our speakers are going to explore are what spaces, what are the spaces in which young people learn, what are the educators in these spaces, etc. And after we heard from uh, our panelists, we will break into uh, small groups and we'll ask you to explore some of those questions as well. So without further ado, I'm going to ask His uh, Excellency, Ambassador Abinador, to come up and oh, okay. uh, share with us. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Duga. Oh, I forgot. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry, Excellency. Did you say that? Well, Our camera is focused. Ah, okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. And he's got that on tape as well. Madam. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, again, uh, thanks, Madam Dugal. Um, uh, I would like to express uh, sincere gratitude to the Baha'i community uh, for associating me with this very uh, important uh, discussion. Um, and uh, to uh, quickly add that when I mentioned that I was invited to this side event, uh, some friends were asking me, uh, are you a Baha'i? Or do they want to convert you to Baha'i? Uh, well, um, I got to learn about Baha'i quite early. I even had neighbors who were Baha'i. One of them is actually attending, uh, a lady attending a conference here. Uh, we're neighbors and I got to learn about Baha'i at that early stage and I respect the Baha'i community a lot. Uh, my working career started as a um, uh, lay missionary in quotes for the Catholic Church movement called International Young Christian Students Movement, and uh, which tried to teach uh, youth uh, leadership through the methodology of review of life. And uh, I see the role of Baha'i in similar fashion because it is not religion specific, it accommodates all the spectrums of the different uh, religions. I mean, who are ready to work for a better I mean, uh, global I mean, community. And that is what uh, the YCS was also trying to do, that to the extent that in Mali, for instance, as a Christian movement, they called it community of believers, and it was uh, meant for Muslims, uh, for instance. Yeah, so haven't I mean, said that, uh, let me come quickly to the very important I mean, uh, point. I consider myself a former adolescent, but a current, <laughs> but a current youth, uh, and not even a, a, gray, a little gray hair will betray my commitment to uh, being and remaining a uh, youth. Uh, and uh, this then um, will make you see where I'm going to come from. That uh, I am strongly pro adolescent and pro youth, as uh, the, this um, uh, program is uh, going to try and uh, portray. I mean an exercise that um, has not uh, reached its uh, uh, climax yet, but it's a work in progress as uh, the world begins to change. You will agree with me that, uh, generally speaking, uh, history is made by people, and the drivers of history are leaders, yes, but uh, organized groups like the Baha'i, among other I mean, organized groups, uh, but, uh, but more importantly, the youth. Uh, the youth have been very critical in the making of history and uh, in this globalizing world what is clear is that the youth are going to be the drivers of uh, change and they are going to be making history uh, as never seen I mean, before. So, um, the second uh, uh, remark I also want to make is about uh, the concept of inheritance. Madam Dugas spoke about the kind of inheritance we want to leave for the youth. And uh, to say that uh, the inheritance is an inheritance of the present and the future, in which the youth and adolescents are, are not just beneficiaries, but are also makers. Um, and that is the process that we are moving into now. And it, we are moving into it because we have an advantage of uh, accelerated scientific and technological advancement in the 21st century as never seen before. Uh, in uh, a communication age as never seen before. And it is, again, the youth and the adolescents who are driving I mean, the process. Then um, related to that is uh, the issue of uh, generations. 
the older generation and the youth and the challenge of communication. Because what is clear is that uh, we have a communication problem which has existed uh, before, continues to exist, and uh, it's even getting um, more challenging because of the current uh, information age where the youth and the adolescents are actually overtaking the adults in understanding what is uh, happening in the world today. And that creates a lot of unease. Because as was said very often from the older generation, when they talk about uh, the youth, it is from the perspectives of morals, how things are changing, I mean, how we see more of uh, nakedness I mean, amongst the youth in their dressing, in their appearance, the way they dress. You know, some of the young men who wear their trousers, and the trousers are almost uh, at the knee level uh, these days. And of course, those perceptions, once you see a person like that, you, you become judgmental and that kind of thing. Uh, so adults would like to see them from that moral perspective. Is, uh, is it realistic? Of course, I mean, not. Is it a matter of concern? Yes, sometimes it is. From the youth perspective also, uh, they look at the adults and the older generation as uh, uh, what? De passé, isn't it? Uh, in Ghana, uh, my friend would tell me, they say, we say colonial, that is the uh, expression we use, the historical, conservative. And uh, then we associate the failures, the institutional failures of the present to the adults um, and that kind of thing. But then the good thing about uh, the youth is that um, the youth are constantly engaged in wanting to see change for the better. And uh, they are inclined towards innovation, creativity, and, and that kind of thing. So uh, how do we address this intergenerational communication I mean, uh, uh, deficit or gaps? And it brings me to the issue that was raised earlier by Madam Dougal, that I think that uh, quality education, uh, both int uh, intragenerational and intergenerational is going to be very key uh, uh, in this exercise. And uh, I, I begin with uh, one component, therefore, of uh, what uh, I call the communication uh, component, that we need to address the issue of our adolescents and youth understanding what real communication is all about. Uh, some of us were privileged to have been exposed to an educational system whereby you could learn about the nature of language and understand that for uh, human beings to communicate, you have uh, one who is an encoder and the other who is a decoder, and between them is the medium of language, and that that medium is not perfect. And therefore, the idea from the decoder, I mean, encoder, to go to the decoder. It depends on how you manipulate that language well enough for your idea to pass on to the other I mean, uh, uh, party. But it's something that we take for granted. So we sit down in a room, and then we communicate the teacher to the student, the student to the teacher, the student to the student. And we think we are communicating, and very often we are not communicating, because we've taken the aspect of communication and language for granted. So, and uh, through this um, uh, exposure also, we enable the students to understand diversity. Because uh, there, there are so many things that come out in the nature of language, and there are different languages, and there are different forms of communication. Symbols, sign language, um, and name them. At the early stage, when we expose students to this, we inculcate in them the concept of diversity as well. The, uh, so the issue of uh, language um, uh, uh, as a science, understanding the art of communication and developing uh, the ability to communicate, whether it is in one's own uh, uh, national language or in an international language, is going to be very key um, for the development of uh, uh, the young people. The second component that I want to speak to is uh, the normal formal education but focused on uh, basic sciences, uh, social sciences, and the humanities, with particular reference to history, geography, 
sociology. But let me highlight history. Very often, a lot of uh, 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 young people in their education are not taught enough of history for them to understand where they really come from, and to uh, understand where they are and where they should be heading to. So at the end of the day, we see each other as different. The human race sees each other as different, whether you are black, white, green, or yellow. Meanwhile, we all come from the same source. And it's through history that we will discover that. Luckily, in the 21st century, there is a convergence, and we are beginning to understand more that, after all, we come from the same source. You take Africa, you look at the configuration of the continent, and you look at the migration patterns, the boundaries that we have today are totally meaningless. So you are in a particular country, and your cousins and your nephews and your what nots are across the border and beyond and beyond. If you take, for instance, Ghana, a lot of the people migrated from uh, Nigeria and, of course, earlier on for, uh, um, uh, further to the east, to Nigeria, along the coast, along the forest line, and along the northern Sahel belt. The same people. So already the beginnings of integration. So when we talk about integration and you look at the history, it gives you already a foundation to understand the process. But unfortunately, the history is not taught the way it should be taught. And people, therefore, don't know themselves and don't know each other enough. So I think we should pay more attention to history and help people to understand and be able to identify themselves properly. Geography, of course, I mean, is another. There are a lot of us, I mean, for instance, uh, I get friends who uh, tell me that, oh, oh ah, you are from uh, uh, Africa, and then... Um, uh, for instance, when I went to Spain in school and I said I was from Africa, they said, oh, uh, you speak Africans, <laughs> for instance. And then um, you think that that was at the time that it was happening that way. But in today's world, people still are limited because they uh, occupy a certain space where the educational system did not open them up. And they were almost self-sufficient in their environment, so they did not even bother about I mean, the others until something happens and then provokes one I mean, to... So geography, again, is another, and sociology. So uh, the, this is a second component that I thought uh, we should focus on. The third key component for me is the normative one, where we teach the young people the concepts of uh, uh, fundamental human rights, the concepts of tolerance, peace, and diversity. If we don't do these together, the normative together with the basic sciences and the communication skills, then we are not helping the youth to realize themselves I mean, uh, fully. And for me, those are key components of quality education for our youth I mean, to be able to realize themselves. The um, other aspect is then how the school system is organized in addition to the curriculum. Uh, because uh, internally, how is the school uh, organized? And externally, what kind of linkages exist with the family, with the community, uh, with uh, the st other state and non-state actors for them to contribute in providing quality education to our youth as I mean, they grow up? And let me focus on uh, um, the external link. Uh, first, the internal in terms of extracurricular activities. I happen to have been a big beneficiary of this in Ghana, having um, joined, as I said, the Young Christian Students Movement. And it taught you that which you could not get in the classroom. Because on the one hand, you are organized into groups, into small teams, and you are brought up in the concept of teamwork and sharing. You are brought up in a... Uh, Critical analysis, we call it the review of life. What was it about? It was to say that in any community that you find yourself, you should see the problems of that community with the eyes of your faith teaching. So if you are a Muslim, you're teaching your holy Quran. If you are a Christian, your holy Bible, and so on and so forth. So you see, you are in the school. If there is a problem, you apply it and analyze it, 
and judge it according to the teaching and then recommend appropriate action and then review the action afterwards and build on it as you go. So we call it the review of life. And um, when you go through that, um, it creates a certain critical approach to life that you don't get I mean, uh, I mean, elsewhere. And there are other uh, associations that inculcate that kind of uh, uh, spirit in the young I mean, uh, people. So that is an extra curricular activity. Sports, which teaches the spirit of teamwork and the ability to lose honorably and to work hard to win, which uh, uh, should complement school, I mean, uh, uh, what do you call it, compensation system of passing your exams. Not many of us have that opportunity, but it is also very I mean, critical and therefore uh, uh, an ingredient for quality education, promoting sports and sports activities. Now, the external linkages, what kind of external linkages exist? We're talking now about uh, adolescent uh, health and youth I mean, health. What kind of facilities exist to complement the school in teaching? Because when you are teaching basic sciences, biology, for the student to understand her body or his body, and there are certain ailments in the community and in the school, what facilities exist? For instance, to help the school do early screening, as we heard, for instance, in the lecture I mean, I mean, today, that some of the problems of cancer start as early as adolescence, among I mean, others. And good hygiene and that I mean, kind of thing. So those external linkages. And the external linkages of youth being participants because they can help their communities when they learn in school and put it into practice, not just at home or amongst themselves, but also to the communities in which they grow. Because if you take Ghana, for instance, at some point in time, Guinea worm was a critical problem. If the student um, is taught proper hygiene, when the student goes back to his or her community, what does the student do beyond the family? within that I mean, community. And already they are active participants. And that is the spirit of voluntarism, which is another one which has to be inculcated in the school. So we have voluntary associations I mean, and a network of voluntary associations, which are not in the country only, but also a network all over the world. You have people from the US going to Africa to link up with their counterparts, some from Europe and some from Asia and vice versa. So, um, uh, th so this has to do with the external I mean, linkages, I mean, as I said. And then uh, division of labor. Who does what? The school I mean, authorities, the, f uh, the families of the students, the local community, the local government, the central government, private sector, non-state actors, the regional organizations, West Africa, ECOWAS, policy coordination and formulation, having a peer review mechanism where um, the West African countries, 15, they look at each other's uh, uh, policies, curricula, and share best practices. Together, do research and in partnership I mean, with the others. So what will be the roles of the regional I mean, organizations as, as well? And of course, our development partners. It's not just a matter of uh, giving technical support or financial support. The development partners also have a role of watchdog, just as the local I mean, organizations have a role of uh, watchdog. Because when you put your money somewhere, you want it to be properly utilized. So you have a watchdog role as well, I mean, uh, liaison with the others. So we need to have a clear picture as to who does what in this scenario. So I thought I should quickly throw up these ideas as remarks to provoke a discussion. I hope I haven't been too long. And uh, to say in conclusion that uh, uh, if we focus on quality education, we will not only be creating the space, as uh, Madam Dougal mentioned, for our adolescents and youth to thrive, but we'll also address the intergenerational um, communication I mean, deficits. Because clearly, in this day and age, the older generation uh, finding it very difficult to cope because of uh, uh, the level um, uh, of uh, development that we are moving into and the pace, sheer pace of the development. And the drivers 
are going to be the adolescents and youth, whether we like it or not. Uh, so we had better focus on that and uh, respect the adolescents and youth as actors and beneficiaries and not just as beneficiaries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency, and you've certainly given us a lot to uh, work with in our discussion later, but now I'm going to turn over to Alicia and ask her to share with us her So thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I feel really honored to speak after yourself, sir. And I think a lot of the thoughts um, that I've prepared really echo and support the really helpful considerations you put forward. So my presentation is going to focus on quality holistic education at the grassroots level that can really assist young people to become agents of change. I'm focusing on my personal experiences, what I've learned from working with pre-adolescents and adolescents in Belize, Zambia, Tanzania, and rural indigenous as well as urban neighborhood adolescents in Canada. This work is in the context of the Baha'i international communities efforts to promote the, the well-being of young people worldwide. And the purpose of these initiatives is to help young people develop a two-fold purpose, which is a concept I'm going to elaborate upon later in my presentation. I want to start by first talking about why this fits into the CPD, in case anyone's wondering. Well, first of all, in a, in a discussion on youth and adolescence, of course, as you had said, sir, the, the topic of quality education is crucial. And as Vani had alluded, it's not properly addressed in the ICPD program of action. And beyond that, a really important topic this year is the participation of youth in decision making and policies that affect their futures. My youth colleague from Sudan on Monday, she gave a very beautiful address. And one of the quotations that I, I got from her, she said, youth will continue to believe that policies made without us, for us, are actually against us. This really struck me. Youth are pining, yearning, longing for governments to recognize them as strategic partners. So why hasn't this happened yet? Well, I think one reason why youth have not been fully part of the solution is they continue to still be perceived as part of the problem. This idea of the troubled teen that Bonnie alluded to is, comes to mind. And some of the phrases and activities we think of is, you know, you talked about the pants being low, we talked about substance abuse, you talk about risky behavior, oh, the rebellious teen, oh, that moody teenager, oh, you have teenagers, are you okay? Are you handling it all right? These are the kinds of um, phrases, these are the kinds of images that come to mind. So underneath our rhetoric of youth being protagonists of change, I believe we still have some unaddressed prejudices concerning the true nature and capacity of this period of life. And it's only when we really understand our true capacity can we become strategic partners. So what are these true capacities? Based on my work with young people, I've learned that adolescents and youth are idealistic in the best way. We don't take no for an answer. We stand up for what we believe. We challenge the status quo. Our mindsets and attitudes are flexible both physiologically and in the way that we carry ourselves so that we can adapt to changing times. And as Severn Suzuki said at the age of 12 in Rio 92, we are highly motivated. Why? Because we're fighting for our future. These are the true qualities of adolescence and youth, and it's high time they were allowed to be fully expressed in meaningful action. So let's say that all the governments of the world take us up as strategic partners. We address these underlying prejudices. There's a youth delegate at every UN convention and the delegation of every country. Youth sit on every decision-making body at the national level in their countries. That would be wonderful. But it wouldn't be enough. Imagine you're a 15-year-old girl and you live in a slum compound of, let's say, Lusaka, Zambia. You drop out of grade six of school because your parents no longer consider it a priority for you to attend, you're a, you're a girl. And also, you, you, your parents can't afford the school fees. You're taught to be quiet, to know your place, and not really to participate very fully in the affairs of your community. And your so-called education didn't equip you with basic numeracy or literacy skills. So even if governments change their stance on young people, 
does that change anything for you? Even if more spaces are available for youth to participate, are you going to enter those spaces? Does this really have any bearing on your life? What I'm saying is that the participation of adolescents and youth includes all young people, HIV positive, teenage mothers, young people with disabilities, rural, urban, wealthy, impoverished, girls and boys. And for participation to truly include all young people, we have to look at the work that needs to be done at the community level in terms of education that can really equip young people to fulfill their potential as these protagonists of change. A Baha'i writing on this subject says that every child is potentially the light of the world. And at the same time, it's darkness. Wherefore must the question of education be accounted as of primary importance? So it's education that really makes the difference, that really allows all young people to be able to fulfill their potential. So that's why we're talking about this important topic today. And the Baha'i International Community currently works in 186 countries on educational initiatives at the grassroots level. These take the form of weekly groups for ad pre-adolescents and adolescents aged 10 to 14 who work with an older youth in their community to develop service projects. And typically these projects um, are done in the very poorest of communities, whether it's urban or rural, because that's where they're needed the most. So what are the components of this work with young people? I want to just discuss four components. The first one is accompaniment. So the person who's running the program is an older youth, let's say 15 to 20, 25. So it's not an older adult, you know, preaching down at, at these youngsters and telling them what to do. It's a youth just slightly older than themselves, who are their friend, who is their role model, and who guides and, and animates the group. So what, the first is accompaniment by an older peer. The second is these programs are at the grassroots for the grassroots. So let's say we're in, an, an, in a rural indigenous part of Canada, it should be an Aboriginal youth from that community that runs the program. And this is very important. So if I'm working in that community, my primary objective is to find youth in that area who are going to be the ones to take over the, the projects. Because really what we've seen in the past is imported educational systems that don't meet the needs of that particular community. And we need to start thinking about how curriculum and approaches can really be developed you know, from the grassroots for the grassroots. The third focus of uh, these programs is on service. And so young people are not just sitting there talking every week. They're actually going out and doing community mapping. And what I mean by that is they're going to talk to key informants in their area, let's say pastors, school teachers, elders in their area, and asking them, what are the issues in our community? And they're going around and they're observing what they can do to address those issues. So it's a really a focus on service and on experiential learning. Some of the kinds of projects they could do, for example, um, some of the groups I worked with in Toronto, they've done social media projects to address bullying in their school, or community or urban gardening, or in Zambia, health education, and you alluded to the importance of that. But it's really the young people themselves coming up with these ideas that address the needs in their own community. And the last component I want to talk about is literacy, language, and the power of expression. And I'm so happy that you also alluded to this uh, before I spoke. So let's think back to that young girl in Zambia and what it would take for her to be truly participating. As I said, her elementary education, which is not uncharacteristic of a lot of elementary education in Zambia, did not equip her with basic literacy skills, reading or writing. And then beyond that, she's not being encouraged to learn how to express her ideas, how to articulate her opinions. So what you'll find among a lot of 10 to 14 year olds is they have amazing ideas for how to make their community better, but they've never had the chance to learn how to express those ideas in a way that really influences the community and in a way that gets people to mobilize around them. So working on literacy is very important in the power of expression. So those are the four main components, accompaniment at the grassroots for the grassroots, a focus on service, and literacy in the power of expression. So to develop these components further, I want to share a, an excerpt that's very close to my heart. It's, it's by a 16-year-old girl who works in my community, and I've, I've had the pleasure of accompanying her to take over these initiatives for her younger peers. And when she wrote this, she was 16 years old. 
Change begins with us. This is something I learned two years ago. See, two years ago, I had a different view on life. I thought the purpose of life was to get an education, to get a good job, so you know I could buy a huge house, a nice car, and everything else. I thought happiness could be bought. That's what my world told me. And I was only focused on the materialistic world. Then I met Alicia, who's like my big sister now. She was involved with working with young people in our community, and she wanted to start a new group in our neighborhood. I'm really not sure why, but I decided to help her. And little did I know it would change my life. So we started the group, and a lot of bored kids actually showed up. OK, so you guys are probably wondering what these groups are about. They are empowerment programs that assist young people to develop a strong sense of purpose, learn how to make good decisions, strengthen their character, and engage in meaningful social action in their communities. Simply put, we're trying to help them grow up to be better people and make a difference. See, when you become a better person, it's really hard not to do the right thing. So imagine if all of the seven billion of us were good people and only did good for the world. What an amazing place this would be. Abita, who's become the 16-year-old girl, one of my closest friends, um, she really described very beautifully the overall purpose and components of this work with young people. And in closing, I want to expand on that, on that overall point, the overall purpose. So I said at the beginning of my presentation, I would talk about this twofold sense of purpose. I want to really expand on what I mean by that. So the main goal of our work with young people is to help them develop this twofold purpose. The first part of this twofold purpose is to know their own talents, their own strengths, and their own capacities. And the second part is to use those strengths and capacities to contribute to their communities, their countries, and ultimately their world. Sounds pretty simple. But how many of us at age 10, 11, 12 were ever asked, at least routinely, were you asked routinely, what are your unique strengths and capacities? I know this was not a common question for me. And yet we so often ask young people, what do you want to be when you grow up? What job do you want to have? Maybe we should be asking new questions. We do not want young people to only fit into an existing economy or beyond that into an existing social order. We want them to be able to create new jobs, to improve their existing social order, to be able to innovate new solutions to the problems of their communities and countries. A Baha'i writing on this broader purpose is that all people have been created to carry forward an ever advancing civilization. All people have this purpose. So for this, young people need to start thinking about their unique strengths and capacities while in their adolescent years and pre-adolescent years. And they absolutely need the chance to start using these capacities in meaningful action. So let's create educational systems and approaches that allow this to happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alicia, for those wonderful remarks. Uh, when I was a, a junior youth, I was told to sit quietly and listen to the wisdom of the elders. And I'm very grateful for that opportunity of having had the elders who imparted uh, their wisdom. But I really wish I'd had an Alicia to, <laughs> to also lead me uh, through all the trials of adolescence. So thank you so much for sharing that experience. We were hoping to break out into small groups and have some discussions and come back. But I'm looking at the time, and I don't know if we'd be able to get you all back to the commission on time if we did that. So we are going to um, just ask you to I'll make short remarks or if you have any questions for our speakers and we can have a discussion. Uh, so if you'd like to raise your hands, if you have anything. 